I mean, what's the trick? The trick is um, imagination, man. It's yeah. um, uh, imagination, ambition, and and uh, a real, I know it's such a cliche, but a real need to disrupt. You have to disrupt shit like crazy. You have to turn it upside down and say, hey, well, let's, do, let's do the opposite of that. Let's, what's in, what, what, always looking for something that, I mean, in every scene and in every moment, what hasn't, what haven't we done before? What hasn't, what's new? So you got to be really ambitious and not safe. Uh, it's safety that's the enemy of, of, of expanding things, I think. I've given up all chance at inner peace. I made my mind a sunless space. I share my dreams with ghosts. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago from which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. My anger, my ego, my unwillingness to yield, my, my eagerness to fight. They set me on a path from which there's no escape. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost. And by the time I look down, there's no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my, what is my sacrifice? I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. Now the ego that started this fight will never have a, a mirror or an audience or, or the light of gratitude. So what do I sacrifice? Everything! Welcome to Behind the Lens. Today, uh, you know his work. <laughs> if you don't know his name, and I know you know his name, but an Academy Award nominated uh, writer and director of the, the entire Bourne trilogy. He wrote all of those, uh, wrote and directed The Bourne Legacy. Michael Clayton, Duplicity, The Cutting Edge, Dolores Claiborne, Devil's Advocate, Oh my God, you know, Beirut, which I love by the way, John Thank Hamm, you. I thought that was great. You go on, your credits are just amazing. And of course, uh, Rogue One. And now, Andor, uh, the series. Welcome, Tony Gilroy. Thanks for having me, Pete. You are always busy and always writing and always coming up with something uh, intriguing. This particular project, Andor, seemed especially challenging. It's a prequel to a prequel, essentially. I guess so, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, why did you decide to take on the challenge of, of what is turning out to be 24 television episodes uh, here? Um, well, I, I was a little naive about what I was getting into, probably. Um, they came, uh, I mean, the success of Rogue made everybody very excited. They wanted to do a, um, they wanted to do a lot of different things. You know, the, always the possibilities, how can they open up how can they open up the Star Wars franchise? What can right. they do to change lanes? And uh, they wanted to do a show. Uh, they came up back about a show about Diego Luna's character, Cassie and Andor, on the show. Could they do a prequel to that, the years leading up to that? Yeah. And they tried it. Uh, they tried it a couple different times, but it was a combination of not being kind of wild enough and also the economics of streaming hadn't really quite arrived as they were doing it. This was like announced five years ago. Yeah, they really, but you know, yeah. streaming, I mean, you can't do this show inexpensively. There's no yeah. way to do Star Wars inexpensively. So the, the sort of, you know, that Venn diagram of when the, the moment meets the economy meets the, uh, meets the right idea. And um, they came back and I had sent, <laughs> I had sent a sort of manifesto critique of one of the other versions in <laughs> a year earlier as a friend in court, just as a thing. And they came back and go, you know, this crazy idea that you gave us, that you talked about what you would do and it seemed so insane. We would actually like to try that. And we would like to spend the money to do that. And we began tiptoeing forward with that. And it, you know, it's, that was three and a half years ago. And, um, it, and <laughs> it, it'll be five years by the time I'm done. So I have another year and a half, two years to go. That, that's amazing. Of course, season one, everyone's seen that, and you're in the midst of uh, shooting season two. The right second now. half is how we're really thinking of it. It's, it's really the, the, the front half and back half. I think of it sort of as a novel, and it's the first half and the second half of a novel. Does this format lend itself, as opposed to doing Rogue as a feature film and things, does this format lend it to that, that intrigues you as a writer, the, the novel aspect of it? Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the whole attraction, really, is... Uh, 
I mean, it's almost as if you've been writing short stories your whole life and all of a sudden you have a, you know, I mean, you, how many screenwriters have you talked to? I mean, we live in a 125 yeah. page ghetto, really. I mean, that's for your whole life, your attention span, everything, your mind is just organized around 130 pages. And it's, um, it's a good way to learn. And we've certainly been, on, many people have done it well, but boy, oh boy, to be liberated from that is, uh, has been, uh, for all the hard work and all the trouble that it causes your life and everything, that, that's what makes it work, worth it creatively. The landscape and the size of the canvas is really an extraordinary thing to play with. While you're, I'm just, I feel really lucky that I'm still strong enough and, you know, <laughs> to do that. It's a, so it's a blessing that. You're the producer, executive producer, creator, writer of many of the episodes mm -hmm. you've done and all of that, and then overseeing the writer's room on it in coming up with all of this, but not taking on the directing aspects of it. I was, I was uh, really vaingloriously going to direct the first three. This was pre-COVID <laughs> and I didn't really know, uh, we had, I had no idea what this job or what the show was really like, what it was gonna really take. Right. And I was in London, I was prepping to direct the first three while I was anticipating, I suppose, you know, all the rewrites on all the scripts that would have to take place. Mm -hmm. COVID hit and uh, COVID saved our show in that sense because it mm -hmm. sent us all scrambling. And then when uh, they started to pick themselves off, the, Disney was one of the first places to pick themselves off, off the map and off the floor and say, hey, we're gonna start shooting in November if we can. I was like, man, I'm not dying for the show. I'm not coming back to do that. And I also now, as I had started rewriting everything, I realized how much work there was. And I said, you know, my, I'm better served if we get a uh, local, get, let's get British directors and let's start that way and do it. And that was a, that really saved me as well because uh, we got great people and I was able to concentrate on all the rewriting and all the show running and all yeah. the stuff that would, it, it would have, it's, I'm too busy to direct. Yeah. <laughs> really, seriously, man, you it's, get too busy to direct. It's crazy. Well, it is crazy. <laughs> that's sort of how you got into this whole rogue uh, universe now, this whole rogue uh, factory. I mean, you came in and did rewrites and reshoots, I believe, on the movie. Is that right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, I don't, it doesn't yeah. behoove me to talk that much about it and I don't really, yeah. people know, yeah, I came in as a, I came in, as, that was a much different experience. I came in as a, as a clinician on that. Right. <laughs> and my, and evolved over time. So it was yeah. a little bit of a, but uh, this is, this is very different. This, this yeah. is homegrown and, and this is all mine. And it's, uh, and it's something I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm probably more proud. At the end, I'll be more proud of this than anything I've ever done. It's the most, it's the biggest, it's the most I've ever had to say and with the best actors I've ever had and many of them. And that's amazing saying that the man that's done the entire Bourne franchise, essentially, Michael Clayton, which was just a tremendous movie that you wrote and directed and was nominated for a zillion Academy Awards and won one for uh, Tilda. For but Tilda, you, yeah. You were no, and she was so great, but I mean, nominated too. Yeah, yeah, no. This one stands out. I'm just getting to talk about I'm getting to talk about so many important things in a really vivid, exciting, anxious story in a real ripping yarn. I get to talk about all the things that I would that I've been accumulating my whole life long and and probably wouldn't have an opportunity to speak about because you, you can't slam things you want. And so I get it, it's it's a. Uh, it's a story about revolution and it's right. a story about people, normal people being thrust into the revolution. We don't have any, you know, we don't have any Jedi, we don't have any lightsabers, right. we don't have any of that stuff. It's, we don't have royal family. This is, you know, as we say, it's, um, it's a show that takes place in the kitchen, not in the dining room. And it's really all, to, and then to have 1500 pages of original story to be able to tell about revolution and what happens to people over a five year period of time with a, with a, with a truly almost messianic character at the beginning and middle of it, who's who's going through something really extreme. Uh, that's a that's a pretty unique opportunity, and we've really poured ourselves into it. So yeah, I'm I, I'm sure I'll be as proud of this as anything. Yeah, yeah. you know, they, uh, they I've heard you know in the Star Wars universe and things, many directors have come in and wanted to do their own vision, and have left uh, and never gotten to do that. Here it sounds like you had a great relationship with Kathy Kennedy, with all the powers that be uh, charged with keeping this, uh, this world going. Yeah, they took a, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, they took a huge gamble on what we're doing. <laughs> I mean, we, and you know how these things go when they're this scale, nobody just says, oh, I'm gonna sign on and you start. There's a long period of time of, of showing work and trying to make deals and you go pretty far along the way, but 
they knew what we were going to do. And I think they very wisely and very badly want to open new lanes into this franchise. Why should it yeah. just be this one thing? There's so many opportunities in the, in the, in the franchise. And so our mandate was to make a new lane, um, try to bring in an audience that may be Star Wars reluctant or Star Wars mm -hmm. resistant, you know, and, and try to do a really a different kind of show for people who may not and, and do a show that you didn't have to watch Star Wars to ever enjoy. And um, they made an enormous gamble. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge gamble. And they used, you know, the down payment really of the hardcore passionate fans that you know are going to be there. Uh, those people were really, and the Mandalorian helps us. That's right. what gave us the muscle, yeah. you know, to go to swing as weird and far as we have. But it's still a huge gamble. And they just, they just backed our play all the way through in the most extraordinary way. And we, we kept our business clean and we, you know, we hit all our deadlines and did everything we were supposed to do. So we were kind of a good kid in school. So we were <laughs> up in London and just, you know, during COVID buttoned up, just, you know, making it. And um, I think everybody's really pleased with, with that. It was, a, it's, it's been really good. I think this is a perfect series and I can see why it's gotten such critical acclaim. Not, not to mention the public tuning in and, and, and right. being fans of it, but it's very relevant. There's a lot of issues going on that are going on in the world today in their own way. And that's why I, I'm sure it intrigued you as a writer. <laughs> it, 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 it's really true. And it's, it's kind of a sneaky answer, but it's, but, but there is, but I'm not being cynical when I say it, that it's, uh, you get to use because it's because it's Star Wars, because it's removed, uh, and because it's fairly articulated. The five years that I'm dealing with is, right. is has a canonical uh, uh, aspect to it. There are events and historical events that I have to pay attention to, and the things that are happening. There actually, it's a good it's a good lane, but um, you can deal with an incredible number of issues that are contemporary, and some of them are very radioactive, yeah. but. I don't have to pull a comp from the headlines. I have 4,000 years worth of history to pull from. So I, you know, and I've been a history nerd my whole life and I'm, you know, it's a stupid dinner table amateur <clears throat> historian in that sense. But I've been fascinated with revolution and, and betrayal and war and, and, and leadership my whole life. And so I've been, I can cherry pick all through every revolution that I know about, and, and they're all different and they're all the same, but this happened here, and this is the French resistance, and this is the Haitian revolution, and oh my God, this is Thomas Paine, and this is, this is from the, you know, Charles I, and this is right. like, this is the Russian revolution, and this is what happened to the show trials, and this has happened, you know, and so I can, I can free myself from being pinned down to contemporary issues, and I can free myself from interviewers who want me to make <laughs> comps between Oh my God! You're telling the story of what's happening now. Well, that's so what they're reading into it. Well, they, know, well, yeah. well, that's. I want the benefit of that without the responsibility. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so far, I'm getting away with it. No, no. but that's so. That's yeah. you know, it's and that's the other. That goes back to your earlier question. Why is this so? Um, it's just the it's the the deepest, richest material I've ever had a chance to deal with. Yeah, amazing. And what a great cast you were able to put together. I mean, you know, you must get down every knee, day on oh your knees God. and pray for S Stellan Skarsgård and Jean Viev and Andy Serkis and, of course, Diego Luna here. Oh, man, it just goes, and it just goes <laughs> so deep. And Nina Gold, you know, who, yeah. Nina Gold and Martin Ware, and, you great. know, yeah, the casting. casting. And uh, <laughs> when we got over there in the beginning, I don't think we had any idea when we started. I mean, we had 194 speaking parts in the first season. I know. And we're doing it again. At, at one point, like a month ago, I said to Nina, are there any actors left? Um, but they were, I don't know if it's her taste or the quality of the training there or, the, or, or just what it was, but we've had so many people come in. And we have, a, I would say we probably have a, a core group of maybe 25, 30 regular people that we're right. carrying. Every single one of them has made me a better writer. It's it's just like, it's like having a great instrument. It's like you can play the upright piano over here. You can play the the Steinway Grand, and you start playing the Steinway Grand, and you just you start playing a little better, and you start playing a little bit more ambitiously. And my writing has, uh, I've really had the opportunity to write for these people, and um, it's just man, it's they just 
make you look so good. It's amazing. The Star Wars universe, those fans out there, the internet, anytime you get into something like this, you're, you're fighting against that even before you've written a oh, word, yeah. oh, you know. God. And the pressure on you as a writer, I'm just curious, do you care? Does it bother you or does it energize you? Um, to do right by them as well, or what they expect, or take them into a direction they didn't expect. It was shocking on Rogue because I didn't really have any exposure when when Rogue happened and all, everything that happened. I was, I was really blown back by what was going on and and this thing that I hadn't paid attention to. Um, so I had a I had a I, had a, I knew about it when I right. came back. I knew what to expect. Um, you have to realize about that community that. They, uh, their passion and is, is, is they love this thing so much. The hardcore, right. deepest, you have within that community, you have Shiites and Sunnis and Kurds, and you have all kinds of people who have different, but their love of the, sh of the show and their love of what it means to them is something that you really have to pay attention to. So my attitude has been, and the attitude of the show is, as much as we, as far out there as we get, and as much as we bend the, tone and the idea of what to do we could never ever be cynical about it we have to take it more seriously than anybody's ever taken it we're never winking we're never kidding it um and so we have this mix of people who know nothing about star wars on our show and then we have we have a, we have a bunch of people on the show that are huge nerds and it's the marriage of of knowledge and history mixed with a real ambition to take it someplace else with a hopefully respect for no, I want the respect of that audience. Now, I, re I do read what they, you know, I, yeah. there's, no, there's no way of doing it and not being controversial. Yeah. There's no way. It's impossible. And like yeah. Kathy's job is to like, right. I mean, you don't want to be Kathy on, and ever up on the internet. It's just, I oh. mean, what she goes through and what they, and it's been on for years, you know, so. Uh, She's amazing. She's amazing. Yeah, it's a, you yeah. got to be really, you have pretty thick skin to do that. But um, I pay attention. I don't think we've made any real adjustments because of it, but um, it's been interesting to watch. Did you have contact with George Lucas at all in talking about this? I mean, considering this is all going on before his first uh, movie in the series. I have had one conversation. George Lucas <laughs> called me after, uh, after Rogue, yeah. and I had a 45-minute conversation with him after he saw Rogue, and that's the only time I've ever spoken to him. What did he think? He loved it. He really did. He he li he he liked it. Yeah. He he had some other things to say that I you know, but um, uh, um, oh really? Yeah, no. I mean, no. He but he he uh, yeah no. It was it was you know. It's like a call from the president or something. It's amazing. Yeah. I have to ask you about doing franchises. Obviously, born you were very involved with. What's the trick? You know, in, in carrying on something like that. Uh, and particularly what you did with Bourne is going from screenwriter and then to directing and writing one with a different actor uh, in that as well. There were all kinds of uh, little. Uh, well, look, things. man, I tried to give them a Marvel Universe with Bourne Legacy. <laughs> no. And they didn't want to take it. I mean, honestly, I, I was the whole goal of that was to open it up. So, open it up, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the. The history of Bourne is one of the most shambolic success stories of all time. I and mean, that would have been a great Hollywood book if someone followed it from the, from the very beginning. You'd never get everybody to tell the true story. But right. it just stumbled towards success all the way through. But it, Legacy, we really tried to give them. That was my goal, was to give them a Marvel universe that they could open up. But there was so much bad blood and other stuff that it just it didn't work for them. That it and I think they tried a TV show afterwards. And it, I mean, what's right. the trick? The trick is um, imagination, man. It's yeah. um, uh, imagination, ambition. And, and uh, a real, I know it's such a cliche, but a real need to disrupt. You have to disrupt shit like crazy. You have to turn it upside down and say, well, let's, do, let's do the opposite of that. Let's, what's in, what, what, always looking for something that I mean, in every scene and in every moment, what, has, what haven't we done before? What hasn't, what's new? So you gotta be really ambitious and not safe. Uh, it's safety that's the enemy of, of, of expanding things, I think. Exactly. We've seen that happen. Oh, my God. Way We're, too many. <laughs> I mean, oh, my Way God. We live in a, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I won't, well, won't name any names, but yeah. we know who the culprits are. Yeah. yeah. Is it fun doing action scenes? Because the act, some of the action scenes in this are so interesting. I mean, if you dissect them and look at the prison and the way you develop that and simple things like they're barefoot because they've electrified the floor and then there's ways you can put water in. And then they, I mean, and you add on those layers just for that one example. It's so smart in the writing of these things. <laughs> See, I, you know, I just finished, uh, like I told you two days yeah. ago, I finished the last script of the 24, the last one. Right. And the last sequence of it, it's the third episode of, it's, it's, 
it's odd, but it's the third episode of the show. And it requires a really huge action crescendo. And it'll be one of the scripts that have, it'll be, I'll have, it'll have my credit on, it's my script. Um, and so I'm building this, you know, they're like Swiss watches, what you have to do. And just, <laughs> I mean, they're really, I've been doing it a long, I've been writing a lot of those scenes a long time. I'm very tired of writing them. Um, and I'm like, this is the last Swiss watch I'm building. I'm gonna build the best one I can because I don't want to do this anymore. Um, what's really interesting about them is you work your ass off on them for right. weeks and weeks and weeks and it's just, it's just grindy mathematical work. And at the end, if you do it right, it looks like nothing. It looks, you get there and you're like, well, of course, this is what it has to be. It's like <laughs> inevitable. It's right. this, it's so clean at the end and it's, and it's like a magic trick and nobody can see the effort that went into it. And it's just, <laughs> I don't know if I'm ever going to do it again, P. I've done a lot of them. <laughs> and my brother, John is there, you know, we built a lot of these crescendo sequences where they're right. not just action, but we get. John, who's editing and is a producer. He's a producer. Well. John and Dan gets, wrote several and episodes. Dan did too, too, yeah. This is the Gilroy Brothers. Yeah, but Johnny's the hot, Johnny's my hostage in London. So okay. he's really on it. <laughs> Danny's a drive-by, but Johnny's really on it. Um, but we built so many, you know, in so many movies and everything where we get, you know, seven plates in the air and an action sequence and everything. And, we, you know, we have these crescendos. We have one at the end of episode three and we have the raid at Aldani and we have the prison break. And, right. you know, there's all, so many things going on. And um, they're a thing. They're a, they're a real thing. And we've learned how to do it. The funeral. I mean, right. And when we went to do the funeral, uh, Ben Karen and his team, um, they came in and, 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 and Jan, who's the editor on it, they had all tiptoed around sequences like that, but we'd made a bunch of them before. And we, sh we basically said, this is how we do it. And they like went and bettered our system. And, and the music in oh the funeral God. was so key to that. Uh, and Nick um, Bertel, Nick Bertel. Well, Nick Bertel, we love Nick Bertel. We bow down here. to Nick Bertel. He's yeah. a genius in so many things. But I mean, that funeral where, I mean, and they did their own. Uh, Nick and I did that first. That's the yeah. very first thing that we did. Long before we started shooting, I went to Nick, long before we would do the rest of the music, I needed eight minutes of music for the funeral. You know, uh, digetic music, which is a term I learned, which means it's live music. <laughs> but we wanted a real band. Live, yeah. We wanted a real band, and an I wanted anthem, a, anthem. An, an amateur band, yeah. a, ci a civic organization, you know, with three different feeds coming in. And so we, we, Nick and I spent our first month working together, coming up with that piece of music. And then, um, and, uh, and, 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 and then that is, it is live in the funeral. Those people are playing. They're all musicians, and we built all the instruments. It's really happening. Yeah. That's amazing. It was really cool. Another amazing piece of casting and getting that to work, too, with everybody in that to do that. <laughs> ah, the timing of all that. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll be back here at some point with another action movie, and I'll, you'll say, Tony, I thought you said you weren't doing this anymore. I don't know. Yeah, well, I don't never, know. Say, never say I, no, never. As I have say. done my share. I have done my fair share. <laughs> Before we go, I have to say, I just watched again the other night, because on the weekends, my wife and I started during the pandemic to watch classic movies, movies uh, based on birthdays or the day somebody died. We watched the only game in town. I forget who in it, oh, whose birthday it was. And that, of course, was written by your father. It's a Broadway play and a movie. I love that movie. I've seen it several times. He won a Pulitzer Prize and a Tony for the subject with roses. Is this where it all came from, from Frank Gelroy, for the three of you to get into this business? And uh, It has to be. I mean, <laughs> he, he moved us away from here uh, when we were fi five, and we grew up in this kind of unusual place upstate New York, not any place you know, a really random sort of place that he picked because uh, he didn't want us to do, he didn't want us to have anything to do with Hollywood. And um, we didn't for a long time. We all did different things and then we all sort of gravitated into it. I don't know, man, I don't know if it's the, I don't know if it's genetics or the water. Uh, the, <laughs> the big advantage, you know, you, you hear all the, ne the nepotism arguments, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and um, I think the one thing that's missing from it, I think the, 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 the piece of the chord that people miss is, it's not that you get a leg, I mean, no one's gonna make your movie because right. you know somebody, yeah. right? No, I mean, no, right. anybody who thinks that's gonna happen, a good script is a good script, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But what you learn, the big advantage that you have is not the connections or, it's that you learn what the life looks like. So I, I don't remember anything other than my father you know, working in his pajamas until noon and then 
taking a break and then going back and disappearing for six months at a time and coming back and going broke and getting rich and, <laughs> you know, like living from check to check and yeah. you and good and great reviews and a success and a disaster and what it means. Like you learn what the life looks like. So it looks like some like you don't have to you don't have to learn how to do that. I think that's the big nepotistic advantage that people have. Not that they get some sort of, I mean, I guess if you're an actor or something, but, but in legit, it, the big leg up is to see that. And so we watched this really cool guy have this really interesting life with a lot of ups and downs, a lot of ups and downs. And uh, he's just a wonderful, a wonderful man. And, uh, and he really, his joie de vivre and his eternal optimism and his joy with what he had made of himself and of us, um, more than anything, we work together and we love each other and we, we, we squabble from time to time about little things, but we are about as, t it's, re it's sickening how tight we are. Yeah. And, and that's, that's more his legacy than anything else, I think, is the fact that we're so close and, and stay that way and we've, and we've been so tight with each other. That's what I think he'd be most proud of. I'm sure he is. That's the Gilroy legacy. Forget the Bourne legacy, it's the Gilroy legacy. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Thank Thanks you, for Pete. Joining Always us. a pleasure, man. Thank you.